If you turn with me tonight to Acts chapter 12, we'd been walking our way through the book of Acts and we took a hiatus for emphasizing of our theme this year, watch. I want to be a watcher. Amen. I'll have you remain seated tonight, but I want to read verse 5 as kind of the pivotal point. And then we'll begin with verse 1 and walk through these verses together. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, the story says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for Him. This is more than just mama praying or wife praying. It was the church praying. And before we speak tonight, if we could pause and just ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank You for Your evident presence in the service. Father, I ask You to shut up my heart to truth. I pray, Lord, that we would feel the same power of the Holy Spirit in the preaching tonight as they experienced in these events that we read about. Turn our hearts towards heaven. Move us towards revival. God, may we be a church that prays in Jesus' name. Amen. I really had Brother Grant bring this here because I don't know, Brother um, Brian, is this your writing? I think this has been on this board for about a year or two. It's an acronym. It says PUSH. I disregard the artwork on the bottom there, but it says PUSH. It's an acronym for PRAY UNTIL SOMETHING HAPPENS. PRAY UNTIL SOMETHING HAPPENS. And our story tonight, the church prayed until something happened. I believe God is calling us to be a church that prays until something happens. We're going to look at this story, but we're living in a time when many folks are downplaying church. I hear and read quite consistently, I can be a good Christian and not go to church. I can pray and not go to church. I can read my Bible and not go to church. Well, I'm not going to beat that drum very much except just to say one thing, and that is to have that opinion, you have to ignore all the Scriptures that say do this one with another. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another. Exhort one another. Bear one another's burden. You do that as a church. But my point tonight isn't to defend church attendance what I want to look at here is the fact that there's something about it. We're not just one individual praise and one person here and one person there, but when the gathering of the believers, the body of Christ, the church, when we pray in concert and in unison for God to move, there's something that gets in, inside that kind of prayer. I do understand if a person's not praying at church, that's a pretty great indication that they're not praying at home either. And I understand something else. If we'll pray at home between the services when we come together and pray as a church, there'll be an empowerment and an impact in our prayers as we pray together. And so I take nothing away. In fact, I, I support, I emphasize the need for private, personal prayer in our homes. But I'm telling you, the story tonight emphasizes that there's just something about it when God's people gather together with the a purpose and an intent and say this is the thing that we've come to pray for when God's people join their hearts and their faith and their intent and their desire and pray God in heaven hears that and He responds with His mighty hand and I believe in 2013 God is looking for a people and a church that will pray until something happens and how many knows there's some things that need to happen this story tells us it's something special to pray. Let's look at it. Verse 1, Now about, the time, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. 
I want to tell you, Satan's always going to use something or someone to reach out and try to cause the church trouble. It's going to be that way. Uh, uh, Sister Heath. Uh, amen. Verse 2. And so what did Herod do? He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is one of the sons of, of thunder. The sons of... Ze uh, uh, sons. My, my mind just blanked. Someone help me out. Not Zebedee, but... Sons of... Is that right? Okay. Okay, I thought I was going to be wrong. This is that James and John. The cousins of Jesus. And Herod killed James. Amen. You know, this is the first thing we're going to have to deal with when dealing with the power of prayer. We have to deal with the fact that James got executed. James had his head cut off. And there's no doubt in my mind that the church prayed when James is incarcerated as well. There's no doubt in my mind when the Word got out uh, that Herod had taken James. Uh, I believe the church uh, prayed. And so the first thing that we have to deal with uh, is God's got a bigger picture than we have. He's got a bigger plan than we have. Uh, and there's going to be times that we pray and God's not going to answer it uh, the way that we think He ought to answer it. What I'm trying to say, we cannot, as the first church refused to do, we cannot get stuck on the fact uh, that God did not deliver James and allowed him to be executed. We can't get stuck on that. What we got to focus on is they prayed for Peter too. And Peter got delivered. James might have been executed when they prayed. But Peter was delivered when they prayed. It's not that God's hit and miss. It's that He's got a bigger plan and a bigger purpose. And the fact is, it's our job to pray and it's God's job to answer as He sees fit in His wisdom and His soul. Sovereignty. Can you say amen tonight? I know James got killed, but I'm going to focus on the fact that Peter walked out of prison. Hallelujah. Verse 3, And because Herod saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And then were the days of the unleavened bread. Jerusalem was filled with visitors. And Herod saw that it pleased the Jews. We're not talking about Jews like Peter and James and John. They're Christian Jews. We're talking about the Jews of Judaism that hated this new sect, they called it. They hated these Christians and they did everything to destroy them. Those Christians who said Jesus was the Messiah and had been killed by them, the Jews. So they, the Jews, and risen from the dead. The Jews didn't like that. And so when Herod killed James, it pleased him. In other words, let me put it to you straight. Herod won political points with these Jews by killing James. And he said, if that has given me some political credit, I'll kill another one of those apostles. And so he took Peter and imprisoned him with the full purpose of killing Peter also just to please the Jews and gain political points. Amen. I want to tell you something. The Scripture says Herod discovered the people were pleased with the killing of the Christian Apostle James. And because of that, he moved further. I want you to know something. I'm not a calamity, Howard, but there's a great bulk of politicians that have discovered that there's a great group and a great percentage of Americans out there that are pleased when things are said and done against Christians. And they're going to take heart in that and they are going to further come against Christianity because they discovered they can score political points by doing it. Even you may not believe it, but that's where we're at. And that's what Herod was doing. He increased his persecution. I've killed James. Now I'm going to kill Peter too. And he arrested him. He had him arrested. Verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after the Passover or Easter to bring him forth to the people. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, you can see here that even Herod recognizes something. I mean, don't you think that's a little overkill? 
One little apostle, one fisherman, and you've got all these soldiers to arrest him. And then you have four soldiers that are, are right there with him at his cell. And you put him in the inner prison we're going to read. I mean, he's three compartments back in the bowels of that prison. You've got everything locked up. You've, you've even chained him to two soldiers. Why was Herod taking all those precautions? Oh, I'll tell you why. Because Peter had already been supernaturally busted out of prison, if I could put it that way, before. There had been one other time. He had been put in there for preaching the Gospel. And God came by and delivered him. Herod had to have heard the story. He said, this time I'm going to make sure he doesn't get busted out. Oh, but you can put all the soldiers on Peter you want to guard in him. You can put all the chains on him. You can lock him not just in the third cell. You can get him even deeper than that. But if God gets ready to deliver him, He's going to be delivered. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you, it's the same with foes in sin. The devil may think he's ha- he has them. He's got them in chains. He's got them in an inner prison. He's done everything to incarcerate their lives. But if God gets ready to deliver them, if they'll say yes, they're coming out. Hallelujah. How many believes we serve that kind of God? Four quaternions, that means four soldiers at a time. He meant six hours a day. It was a 24-hour guard. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison. I mean, there he is in prison. Kept in prison. I went through all those things Herod did to Peter. Because before we talk about him, by the way, I never told you my, 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 my title tonight. My title tonight. Is the power of prayer. But before, thank you, brother, you're right on it. The power of prayer. But I shared all those things of how Herod took Peter and did everything he could to secure him in that prison. Because before we talk about the power of prayer, we have to see the power of Herod. I mean, he used the fullest extent of his authority and his power to bind and incarcerate Peter. You would have seen what he did and said that Herod is a powerful man. He has all kind of power. Look at the power He has over Peter. Oh, but all of that is going to be overcome. All the power of Herod is going to be overcome by the power of prayer. The power of a praying church. When In Herod's day, you would have been talking about the power of the government. But wait a minute. What about the power of the Holy Spirit filled church that goes to prayer? We talk about the power of darkness. The power of the wicked government, the power of sin, the power. Yes, that's all true. But there's a greater power. It's the power of a blood-washed, Holy Spirit-filled church that says we're going to pray until God moves. Hallelujah. What about that power? And so here Peter is in prison. But as I read in the text, he's in prison, but prayer was made. He's in chains, but prayer was made. And it wasn't, let's remember Peter in prayer before we're, we, we're, we're, we're dismissed tonight. It was, no, we're going to pray without ceasing unto God for Him. And the church went to pray. Verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the next day Herod's going to bring him out to execute him. That same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. Peter, tomorrow we're chopping off your head. Now, I don't know about you. I'd like to believe I have faith in Jesus Christ. But I don't know about you. If I knew my head was going to be chopped off tomorrow morning, I doubt I'd sleep very much tonight. You doubt me? Some of you won't be able to sleep tonight because you've got a dentist appointment in the morning. You're not going to have your head chopped off. You're just going to have your teeth worked on. I think those soldiers marveled. I mean, chained them. To, that's uncomfortable in itself. How would you like to try to get in a comfortable position tonight when you've got two burly soldiers chained to you on either side? But Peter fell asleep and he slept like a baby. I'll tell you why. 
He was sold out to Christ. And he had the peace of Christ that passeth understanding to keep his heart and his mind. I mean, it was his faith is real that can do something like that. Going to have your head chopped off and you go to sleep. I don't think the soldiers slept. They probably weren't supposed to on their job. But I think they looked down and said, how can he be snoring that loudly and deeply? And we're going to execute him in the morning. I believe conviction even set down on them that this man has to have something. This man is for real. Verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote, the angel smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Now, I just told you Peter was sleeping heavily, peacefully. He was so heavily asleep that the light, divine glory light, shined in his dark cell. And he's so far asleep, it didn't even wake him up. I mean, he's so far asleep that the Bible said the angel smote him on the side. I mean, that really gave it to him to wake up. I mean, Peter might have awake and going, ow. Sometimes God has to give us a few owls to wake us up. You ever had one of those from the Lord? He smote him and he said, now, Peter... Get up. And he reached down this angel. You know, that's a tremendous thing. An angel. I mean, a messenger of God. I mean, people have done a lot of, uh, uh, of, of uh, um, corrupting our idea of angels. But I want you to know, angels are real. And they're sent forth to minister to those that are the heirs of salvation. And God sent an angel. I mean, He went right where He needed to go. He's right there in the cell. The messenger of God, the light of God, lighting up that cell so they can see what's going on. And He took Him and He raised Him up. And as Peter arose, His chains fell off His hands. Hallelujah. Just fell off. You know, God's able to do that. I mean, He's able to reach down and get a hold of us and lift us up. And as we're rising, the chains are falling off. How many's ever had that happen to you? So down, so so bound, so chained. But God was able to come right where you were and get a hold of you and lift you up. And you found that in His lifting, the chains just started falling off. I believe in a God who can set free. Amen. If you're in that place tonight, Amen. He's able to lift you up. And in the lifting, the chains will fall off. Hallelujah. I know he was delivering Peter from something that he didn't do no wrong to be there. But I'm telling you, even if, even if it's a matter of sin, thank God Jesus said, I came to set the captive free and to open the prison doors and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And thank God for a light that can shine in the darkest of prisons. Have you ever felt imprisoned by your problem so dark? But God was able to shine a light right into it. And it's not just that that was the glory of God. That was a practical thing. How many's ever tried to get dark, get dressed in the complete dark? Amen. That's why some folks have come to church with different colored socks on. Someone came once with one shoe, one thing, one one or the other. It's hard to get dressed in the dark. But we're going to see in the next verse. Don't even the angel tell him to get up. He said, get dressed. And that, that glory light <laughs> gave Peter the ability to see what he needed to do. Look at verse 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. I mean, in the dark, he couldn't even find. I mean, he's in the innermost prison. In the dark, he couldn't even find his sandals. But the angel just lit up the whole cell. I don't know what happened to those soldiers he was chained to and the ones outside his cell guarding it. I don't know if they were struck like at Jesus' tomb. I don't know what happened to them. But it if they were conscience at all, I'm sure they, they couldn't, couldn't even find it in themselves to speak or move. Because what a tremendous thing. That wasn't fantasy. That wasn't hallucination. That was the supernatural intervention of God. How many still believe God supernaturally intervenes? 
And the angel said, Gird yourself, get your sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. In other words, get your clothes on. He went out with him. Amen. Amen. Listen, sometimes it's one thing for God to unchain us, but we got to realize if He unchains us from in that place, He intends for us to leave that place too. He intends for us to leave the place that we were chained in. And so the angel not only unchained him, he said, get your outer garments on, get your sandals on, we're going to leave. Amen. We're going someplace. I believe God sets people free to take them somewhere. That's what the angel was doing. He said, get your garment and follow me. And he went out, verse 9, and followed him. And wist not that it was true. I mean, too much is happening too fast. It's so supernatural. He, he didn't even know if it was a real thing that was done by the angel. He even thought, maybe I'm dreaming. Maybe I'm having a vision. But verse 10, when they were past the first and the second ward, he's in his cell. He comes through the first gate. He comes through the second gate. I mean, they really got him way back there. And then they came unto that big, the prison gate, the main entrance gate, that iron gate that leadeth into the city and to the street. And as the angel and Peter began to walk up to that iron gate, it just it was locked, it was barred. I mean, it was secured. But when the angel and Peter began to walk towards it, it just opened up. Hallelujah! Who opened it? Hallelujah! God of heaven reached down, unbarred that thing, and swung it open. I don't know if I'm remembering when they first came out or just when I first took notice of them. But I think it was about when I was five or six years old when the supermarkets got the automated doors. You know, this is way back for you young people, but you have, used to have to step on a black rubber mat to activate it. How many knows that? Remember that? I don't know how God did it. Amen. How many remembers when those automatic doors first came out? I mean, kids, everybody's kind of amazed at it. I mean, you don't have to push it open. Nobody, oh, you just walk towards it and it opens up. I know they got electric eyes and things like that. Amen. You know, I, I walk fast. You may not know that. Everywhere I go, I walk fast. And I'll go to the hospital. And sometimes they don't open fast enough for me. I don't think the angel or Peter ever slowed down. That angel, that angel knew what God was going to do. I'm telling you, God knows how to bring anybody out of any place. He knew right away. And they just started walking. Let's, come on, come on, let's get out. I mean, they, they never stopped and paused and had to wait for it to slow down. I mean, here's the gate. They just walked right through. I mean, it was opened right on time. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I, we're talking about a God that knows how to set free. He knows how to deliver. And the iron gate that led into the city, it opened to them of His own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. I don't know what that felt like. The angel got Peter out of prison, delivered him, did what Peter couldn't do. But he said to Peter, you're going to take it from here. Now listen, I thank God for the deliverance He gives and the things He does for us we couldn't do for ourselves. But there comes a time that the angel's going to go away and God wants us to get busy walking by faith again. He's done the thing. He's delivered. And now we're in the street. But the angel's going to depart. But don't head back for the prison. That would have been a foolish thing to Peter to head back and knock on the door and say, hey, wait a minute, let me back in. Too many folks have done that after God's delivered them. God's delivered you the light might have it might not be shining any longer. The angel might be have gone back to heaven. But there's one thing you can do. You can continue on the street. Amen. He's alone. The angel's gone. The light's not shining. But he's still walking in faith, rejoicing in what the Lord has done. Oh, hallelujah. You, know, you get excited when you read the book of Acts. These aren't mythical stories or legends. These are historical accounts of how the Holy Spirit and God moved in the church. And this is an account of what He wants to do today. Verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now, I know the surety that the Lord has sent His angel and hath delivered me out of Herod, the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation 
of the people of the Jews. I want you to notice the first thing he did. He took no credit whatsoever. He'd been like some Christians today. He had called the publisher up the next day and said, I got a story how I escaped from Herod's prison. But Peter took no credit. He said, I didn't get out of there on my own. The Lord sent His angel and delivered me. Oh, hallelujah. How many is ready to give the credit to Jesus? But he also was recognizing in that moment his life wasn't going to end in the morning. God had set him free because God had more for him to do. I want to tell you, with every deliverance God makes, He's saying to the one He delivers, I've got something for you to do. Hallelujah. And verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now I want you to notice several things. First of all, when he got loose, the first place he wanted to head, I know they were gathered in the home, but the first place he wanted to head was the church. He wanted to be with his people. This this Mary is the mother of John Mark. John Mark is a disciple of Peter. In fact, John Mark, this John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, taking the testimony of Peter and writing it. But Peter said, I've got to get to where the people are God, the people of God are. Don't you think it was a wonderful thing? The closer he got to John Mark's house, I believe he began to hear the saints calling on the Lord. I've been on, in this all my life, but I still say there's nothing as moving than to hear a group of God's people earnestly and sincerely calling out to God for Him to move. It'll move you. I think he's moved. And I do want to know, you to notice here, he could tell by the sound of it that there were many gathered together praying. I, I, I'm here to challenge, not to make us feel bad. Thank God for the few he always raises up to pray. And God does move in response to the few that are determined to pray. But what a difference it would make if it weren't a few, if it were the many that would pray and seek the Lord. Every time there's a many in that prayer room, I start getting excited because I begin to think how that must look to God. That many. I'm not here to condemn. You can call an ice cream social. You'll have 200 folks. You call a prayer meeting. You'll have 12. Uh, you can... You, you can come to your own conclusions. We like ice cream more than praying. I mean, you know, draw your own conclusions. But what would it be if the many would pray? Hallelujah. Brother Hurst, you're going to have to turn the heat on in Sister Brock's Sunday school class on, 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 on Sunday nights as well because we've got so many in the middle room. We need another room to pray. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Brother Brian, you're sharing your burden. What do you think would happen if many would pray? I believe some prison doors would swing open and some chains would fall off some folks. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Let's go on. Verse 13, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened the gate for gladness, but ran back into the house and told how Peter... You know, you can almost see this. Uh, you know, you know I, I'm glad females can get excited because sometimes we men don't get excited about anything. But here's this girl. It's Peter! And leaves him standing in the street. I mean, the soldiers are after him. They're closing in on him. I, I mean, they're looking for him. And she leaves him locked out in the street. I got to thinking about that. Peter had no problem of the prison doors being unlocked so he could get out. But he had a problem with the church door being locked so he couldn't get in. And I know I'm stretching the application this night. But I tell you, some people may find it easier sometimes for the prison doors to be opened than for the church door to be unlocked. Amen. I believe whomever God loosens the prison door for, the church door ought to be unlocked too. Amen. Hallelujah. 
She left him standing there. I know she was happy. She was excited. But there he is standing in the street. Verse 15. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. You don't know what you're talking about. But she constantly, I mean, she kept on. It's true. He's there. I'm not lying to you. I'm not seeing things. He's there. She affirmed. And they said, It's his angel. Now, you have to understand the Jewish mindset. Many Jews were taught that each of us have, have a guardian angel. And that that guardian angel could take the very appearance and the form of the person they were guarding. I look in the mirror and I say, that's a scary thought that i got an angel that looks like me. But that's what they said. They said, they said maybe it's not Peter. And you know what they're saying by this, though? If Peter's not here and his angel is, that means Peter died. I mean, I mean it, it's a, they don't know what's going on. And, and, and here there's thinking that perhaps he's even been executed. You gotta keep in mind that even though they were praying, they had just recently prayed for James, and he was executed. And they felt perhaps that it happened to Peter. Now I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people speak critically of this praying church. And say, look how, look what a lack of faith that they had. They're praying for Peter to be released. And yet they have such a lack of faith, they don't even believe it when Rhoda tells them he's standing at the door. How many's heard folks just pretty much give it to those folks for a lack of faith? Well, you can give it to them if you want, but I'll tell you one thing they did. They still prayed until something happened. You can talk about their lack of faith, but they had enough faith to just keep on praying until Peter was released. Hallelujah. I tell you, that's what we need to do. A lot of things can come. A lot of doubts can come to our mind. We can think of a lot of things. But I tell you, when God begins to move, it's when we say, God, I don't understand things. I don't understand why James got killed. But I know You're a good God and I know Your answer prayer. And one thing I'm going to do, in spite of any doubts or questions I have, I'm going to keep on praying until something happens. Hallelujah. Peter continued, verse 16, knocking. When they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. James had been killed, but Peter is released. They're astonished. Sometimes we may have prayers that don't seem to be answered. But we should never forget one thing. If we keep praying, God's able to answer prayer in a way. We will be astonished. I like that. You know, that's a true sign of God. When things are happening, you cannot explain in human terms and human reasons. How many still believe God can move in ways that will astonish us? Verse 17, But He beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace. In other words, you guys are loud. You're stirring up things. The neighbors are going to hear this. They'll be sending for the police. He declared unto them how God, the Lord, had brought him out of prison. He didn't say, I broke out. He told them how the Lord brought him out of prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. If you're questioning, I thought they executed James. This is another James. And this is a great story in itself. The James that was executed was... John, the fisherman's brother. But this James is the half-brother of Jesus. His brethren did not believe when he walked on this earth. But the resurrected Lord, Paul said, showed himself to James. And James believed. And in believing, James came to the point that he was the leader, or the pastor, if you please, of the church of Jerusalem. He was the leader of the Christian Jews. He wrote the epistle that's in your body of your Bible. The epistle of James. And by the way, I don't know how many did, but another half-brother of Jesus got saved, and that would be Jude. I'm telling you, this thing was real. They lived with Him. They were doubters. But when they met the resurrected Lord, they had to conceive. He lives. He's alive. I'm telling you, this thing is real. It's not dead religion. It's not philosophy. This is all based in this fact. Jesus was crucified, but God raised Him from the dead, and He's at the right hand of God, pouring out the Holy Spirit to move supernaturally in the midst of His church.
And so Peter went to another place. Verse 18, Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers of what was become of Peter. You can imagine. I don't, I'm not even going to attempt to describe that scene. But the man there guarding, he's gone. Chains are still on the soldiers. Doors are locked. Peter's gone. That was the highest security prison they had. And Peter's gone. I like the way it puts it though. There was no small stir. God has a way of stirring things up. And when He does, it's no small stir. This may be a strange request, but how many will pray with me for no small stir? Hallelujah. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea and Caesarea and there abode. Make one historical note. He fell into such displeasure of the Jews over this incident and some others that he left Jerusalem and never went back until his death. God not only released Peter, but He got rid of the enemy too. He can do that. The power of prayer. And so I want to end as I begin tonight. As the church of the living God, how many is willing? we got revival coming up in the month of February. But how many is willing together to push, to pray until something happens. Hallelujah. Would you stand music? Would you come? I know we have those that are sick we've been praying for. And we have those requests and we have others tonight. Many of you have something heavy on your heart this evening. Here in a minute, I, I, I want to ask us to do this because it's something about we join our prayers together. Amen. This is the middle division. But if the ladies over here and the men over here, I want you to come and stand tonight if you would. We're just going to have a season of praying together. I know we have our prayer meetings and, and I know we prayed before service. But I just, I just want us to pray together as a church. Amen. You know, there's something God wants to do through His church and that's to intercede. And to intercede means you move beyond positioning, petitioning God for your own needs. In intercession, you begin to plead with God for the needs of others. You stand in their behalf and pray for their and their behalf. And I just want to ask you tonight, right as we come to pray, amen, to begin to intercede and pray that God would move in the lives. I know Peter was there for, for a good cause, but we know a whole lot of folks that are in prison of sin and prisons of their own making and chains of the enemy. But we know a God that can get into the innermost prison and open the doors and take the chains off. Would you join me? Sisters over here, brothers over here, Let's just gather in church and we'll say we're going to pray. We're dedicating ourselves not to just this night, this evening, but we're dedicating ourselves to the services in the weeks ahead. We're going to pray. Come and stand so more of us can get around the front. Amen. And let's begin to pray. Maybe you want to pray for your neighbor. However, but let's begin to call out to God together and seek the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we're going to pray. God, we have serious needs in our midst. There are broken hearts. There are heavy burdens. There are sicknesses. There are difficulties. There are temptations. There are trials. But we gather together to pray. Get in as close as you can tonight. Let's join our prayers in unison. Reach out to the Lord. Hallelujah. Maybe you want to pray with someone. It doesn't matter. Well, let's reach out to the Lord together. Hallelujah. Come on, let's begin to intercede. Lord, we reach out to You. Lord, we need You. Lord, we got to have You. I can pray. I can pray. Let's pray tonight. Let's reach out to Him tonight. Oh, pray for these needs. We've heard the request over and over, but we're praying tonight. We've heard the request over and over. We're praying tonight. We pray together. Pray one with another. Seek the Lord. Call upon Him. Reach out to Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pray with one another. Pray in 
to the walls. I Come down. Pray. pray. Intercede. God, I pray for my brother. God, I pray for my sister. God, I pray for that need. God, I reach out to you for that need. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let's sing young ladies. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Call upon him. I need you. Pray, young men. Young men, stick together and pray. Stick together, young men, and pray. Oh, men of the church. Men of the church, pray. Hallelujah. Men of the church, pray. Hallelujah. Let's keep praying until something happens. Hallelujah. 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 I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I can pray. Come on, that's it, sisters. Bind together, sisters. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're the same God that delivered Peter. You're the same God that delivered Peter. You are able to deliver. You are able to set free. You are able to open the door. You are able to cause the chains to fall off. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You're the risen Savior. You're the healer. You're the deliverer. You're the one that sets free. Oh, Blessed be the Lamb of God. Blessed.